be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so uh just a little background on me i'm uh i'm the second oldest of six boys and uh my mother was our rock you know she she did everything that she she did everything to make sure that we knew our lord and savior jesus christ you know she taught us all that and she came out of a Catholic background, and for her reason, she didn't want to stay in that. And uh, we ended up going to Bethlehem Baptist, which was a church on the south side that would come down and bring a bus down through uh, Cumberland Gardens, and we used to go to Bethlehem, Bethlehem Baptist. And I've been in church all my life, since far as I can remember back. <clears throat> I even actually ran away from home to go to church. My mom wasn't feeling good at one particular day, and she didn't want to go to church, but I wanted to go to church. I made sure I went to church. And uh, one, when she woke up and realized I wasn't there, I guess she had an inclination that I would be in church, and she called, and I was there. We're not going to talk about the punishment I got after that, though. But uh, like a lot of people, you know, you get older, you get in your teen years and you think you know everything and I don't need to go to church. Church is right here. Well, that's who I was. And I ended up doing other things. And the longer I stayed away from the church, the more the world grew inside of me. And I found this thing called alcohol. Boy, that was like, let's just put it this way. Every time I got in trouble, it was alcohol, you know? And, uh, we seen a lot of uh, a lot of bad things. Did a lot of bad things. Got in some trouble. But the Bible says, if you rear a child up in the way he should go, it will never depart, Amen. because God never departs. Exactly. You know, and uh, there's so many things that I could tell you, but the one particular t story I'm gonna tell you, it kind of kind of gets to me, cause. I did not see this coming. I planned for everything, but not this, and that's the Holy Spirit. But it involves my brother. And we were drinking, we were jumped. I was stabbed three times, and he was stabbed twice. And, uh, He laid in my arms. He also had his face. He was hitting the face with a baseball bat. And he laid in my arms. And all I could do was cry out to the Lord. He had punctured his lungs so he couldn't breathe. And I tell you that because God was with us. Those same streets that we were on we do outreaches on today. The trouble that I got into that probably I should have been arrested for, we did prison ministries together. Me and my brother. We've been through a lot. And now I'm at a point where I can see every time that the Lord was there with me. He wouldn't let me go. He would not let me go because he made a commitment to him. I made a commitment to him and he made a commitment to me. And that's what this is all about. You know, every, we get sometimes get caught up in the things that are going on in the church, but you know what? It comes down to Jesus and what he has done and what he will continue to do for us, you know? So the Lord put it on my heart to share that, but I eventually I ended up, uh, I met my lovely wife, Stacy. Some of you guys know her. My wife is a uh, registered nurse and she works in uh, uh, behavior health. So she's uh, 
when we had our boys, Isaiah and Jacob, we thought it would be best that she worked the weekend program and I worked during the week. So most of the time she's working. She takes off on certain days and you'll see her here. And uh, my drinking caused issues with her in our relationship. And uh, we ended up uh, parting, but the Lord brought us back together. And uh, my wife came up in the Catholic church. So when she went to, when I asked her to marry me, when she went, she wanted to get married in the church, she went to the Catholic church. But because we were living together, they wouldn't marry us. But whew, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> She reached out to this pastor, Pastor David Massey, and uh, changed everything. He came to the house, opened up his Bible, and he changed everything. It was like I was a kid again, you know? And I remember when he left, I told my wife, man, I got to get to his church. And I think that was back in 2003, and I've been here ever since. So... That's a little of my story. Uh, I have, uh, we're going to be in the book of Jude, which is amazing because what the Lord has put on my heart here is uh, because we're doing communion today and it kind of falls in line. So I'm going to be reading Jude chapter, uh, I'm going to be reading one through four in the book of Jude. And I'm going to go through my notes and and it's an inside look of what I go through when we do these studies, you know? So, the word of the Lord says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Verse 2, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop there. So, Jude, who is actually Judas, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, according to one commentary, is believed so that not to link this Judas with the infamous Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, the English translators used the name Jude. Now, Jude was one of four brothers of Jesus Christ. Matthew's chapter 13, and by the way, I'm going to give you a lot of different uh, verses and just, just to let the Bible speak for itself. So if you take notes, just listen to it for the, the verses. You can write them down and then go back and read over them. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, recounts Jesus' siblings. As it says, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Jose, Simon, and Judas? Like his brother, uh, James, Judas calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ, which is a willing slave. And that's what we're all called to be, willing slaves. Willing slaves of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 22 reads, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have the fruit to holiness and to the end everlasting life. Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses 9 through 10 says, Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing to all things, not answering back, not perforating, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And in that, we have a great example 
which is found in Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 through 4, which reads, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he, ha all he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in the sight, in his sight, and served him. Then he made him over, over, overseer of his house and all that he had. He put under his authority. So, because of how Joseph handled himself, because of the what he saw in Joseph, that affected Potiphar, who was his master at the time. And that's what God wants us to do. It's amazing because we talked about this at the men's study. There's something in us. There's something because God created each and every one of us. He breathed the breath of life in us. And with that, we have certain traits. And when God says to act a certain way and to say a certain thing, it's because our bodies have been, our conscience have been designed to feel it, to hear it, even if we don't want to. Even if we don't want to. It's deeper than I think we can actually really imagine. Jude didn't start out as a, uh, a bond servant of Jesus. At one time, he was an unbeliever. John chapter 7, verse 5 reads, For even his brothers did not believe in him. It was the resurrection that changed the heart of Judas. Jesus was family, his older brother, raised in the same house in the same house with this man that was doing the things that he was doing. But yet he was, he didn't believe. He would have been a major influence over the whole family. They would have seen Christ live his life, a righteous life daily. Now perhaps Judas discerned something special about his brother, but just couldn't connect the dots until he sees Jesus falsely accused, beaten, scourged, humiliated, then nailed to a tree, and pierced in his side. Maybe it was him hearing Jesus shout out in Luke chapter uh, 23, verse 34. It says, forgive them, Father. Forget, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you got to think, what was what was? Jude's mindset in this. What was he thinking? How? How could my brother say those things? How could he feel those things after being humiliated, after being beaten, after being scourged and, and, and pierced on a tree? How could he feel that if it weren't true? Jesus would die on that tree, fashioned into a cross. God. The two words that indicates God's intervention. Jesus told the Jews when they asked for a sign in John chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus was referring to his resurrection. He told the religious leaders in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I received from my father. God's will for Jesus was death. Death for a world that didn't deserve it death for the sins of the world. And we know what the sins of the world are. Think about it. Think about what terrifies you right now. Jesus literally died for those sins and the people that commit those sins. He was bruised for our iniquity and chast the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. That's Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. Jesus' sacrificial de death paid the price for our everlasting life. He was and is the perfect sacrifice. Luke chapter 9, verse 35 tells us, And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, 
Hear him. Hear Jesus. Listen to him. He was and is the perfect sacrifice. How do we know that? God said so. God said so. Mark chapter 16, verse 5 through 7 reads, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in, in a long white robe sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified? He is risen. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. You will see him as he said to you. Jesus told them over and over again. I'm coming back. But yet they didn't believe. The blessing is we see that he told them and we know that he's coming back. But he told us he's coming back again, right? So we know that he's coming back. Seeing the resurrected Christ nullified all doubt for Jews, for Jude, even to the point that he didn't feel worthy to acknowledge his relationship to Jesus in his own epistle. The truth of who Jesus was and is humbled Jude to the, to the place of servitude. Jude goes on to say, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Jude reminds his brothers and sisters in the faith of how they came to be. They were called. Man doesn't seek God. God seeks man. We're told in Psalms chapter 53, verses 2 through 3, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have, all to, they have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. That's what God said when he looked down. So when people think that, well, I can get there because I'm a good person, that tells us that's not true, right? It's not true. Now think about that. For humanity, rejection can lead to depression. What does rejection do to God? Do we ever think about that? Do we ever think about what our rejection does to him? We know that he had a prophet that he sent to marry a wife of whoredom to show his people what it did to him. Because we all know what adultery would do to us, right? God did that to show them what it does to him. It hurts. The reason why we hurt, because we were, we were created by a God who hurts. God made man in his own image for his own purpose to be a representation of his authority in the world he created. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 tells us that, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God breathed the precious breath of life into the nostrils of man. But instead of praising God, man disobeyed God. And sin entered into the world, separating man from God, denying God his rightful place at the side of man and in the heart and soul of man. But God, again, the two words that indicate God's intervention, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 reads, But God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus restored man back to God. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51 read, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
and the earth quaked and the rocks split. The temple had two veils, one in front of the holy place and the other separating the holy place from the most holy place. This was the veil that was torn from top to bottom, demonstrating that God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, restored access to himself that whom he calls, he can freely come. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus did that. But it was a plan God had from the beginning. He knew what would happen. But the Bible says God will never leave us or forsake us. And he proves it to us every day. For Jude, it was the truth, knowing the truth. And you ask, what is the truth? I'm glad you asked that question. Here are some definitions of truth. The state of being true accords with fact or reality, an established or verified fact, absolutely perfect stands on its own merit, has nothing to hide, not affected by approval or disapproval or examination or investigation. When praying, when praying to the Father, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In the world that we live in today, God wants us to have that truth. Because that, those are the weapons that we have against the lies. It's truth. Jesus is the truth. The acronym for Bible is Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Think about that. Basic instructions before leaving earth. That means that this book is what you need for your next stage of life. That's the truth. Anything other than this book is not truth. It makes sense. God has given us a manual to stay on course. Is it easy to stay on course? No, it's not. But God will never leave you or forsake you. He will let, never let you go. And I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. He will bring you, he will steer the ship if you allow him to. The truth is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the truth. Therefore, his word is truth. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' statement is a bold one. How can he make such a bold statement? The answer is found in the word. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 reads, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the word who was with God in the beginning. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Before the world was, was the word. Jesus is the word that was with God in the beginning. Jesus is the word. So what is the truth? First John chapter 4, verses 2 through 3 tells us, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This 
And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Jesus is the word who was with God in the beginning. Anyone who would say anything other than that does not know God. Again, what is truth? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Is God calling you? I don't know if everybody in here is believers, are believers, but or if we're on net and people are watching, but is God calling you? The fact that you're here or listening online, he's calling you. You know, God called Moses. Exodus chapter three, verse four reads, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. God called Isaiah, the prophet, in chapter 6, verse 8, says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Have you responded to God's call in your life? Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7 read, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Will you say, here I am? God desires that those who are with him be like him, holy and sanctified. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 reads, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregations of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines holy as exalted or worthy of complete devotion, as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. The Hebrew word for holiness means to set apart for a purpose. Those who are called by God can't be God. Only God is perfect. But we can be set apart for God's purpose. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 reads, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you proclaim the praises of him who called you. Out of darkness into a marvelous light. God's chosen are to forsake all that the world has to offer and cling to the perfect will of God. The Bible says, hate the world and everything in it. Sometimes we got to think about that. You know, when you think about Lot's wife leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, she turned back. When she turned back, the Bible says she turned into a pillar of salt. She missed something. She missed something. You don't ever want to be found missing something because there's nothing more precious than Jesus Christ. If we know just by, I, I just pray that, that the, everything that, I'm, that the Lord has given me on who his son is, is making us realize that no matter what stands before us, no matter what we have in this world, it doesn't compare to who Jesus is. And he said, I go prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. I go prepare a place for you. That's the world I want to be. Everybody should want to say, hey, you know what? I'm ready. Come get me. Because we know there is no suffering, there's no pain, there's no stumbling blocks, there's no addictions, there's no death. 
the people who are there who are ready to meet with you, your family, your loved ones, your friends, you'll never have to lose them again. Never. That's a promise made by God. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 reads, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How can you know that perfect will of God if you're not walking with God? If you're not talking with God? If you're not communing, if you're not meditating on God's word, God is God. He never changes. He's the same today and yesterday and tomorrow. He does this for us because he wants us to change. He wants us to be better. He wants us to be filled with him, the things that we need. He knows that this world is bad. He knows that the, the enemy is at us. He wants us to be filled with him so that we have what we need to fight the good fight of faith. God told the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29, verse 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you realized a loved one called you and you missed the call, would you call him back? How much more should you call on the Lord, the creator of all existence? Let me say that again. The Lord is the creator of all existence. Can you imagine that? The creator of all existence wants you to be his child. You know, think about that. The only thing that we can really put that into perspective with is, is the person that you look up to the highest, the, the most, and you don't know them at all, but yet that person says, hey, come be my child. You'd be like, what? And he's a filthy sinner like I am. Imagine the creator of all existence, all righteousness, all love, purified, personified, wants to know you. That's so different from the world. Usually someone up there up as high, no, don't, you're nothing to me. What are you? Get away from me. But this is the creator of the all existence who wants you to be his child. You know, sometimes you just got, sometimes that really blows you away when you think about it. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse three says, call me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. When we call out to God, God hears our call. Exodus chapter three, verse seven reads, and the Lord said to Moses, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. If God knew their sorrow, God knows our sorrow. This is, this is, this is not somebody that doesn't want you close. This is about everything that I'm saying up here. As I'm standing here, I'm just realizing that this is just, this is about a relationship that God wants with us. Every part of what I'm saying is about someone who loves you. Someone who wants to be with you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse eight reads, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we are in Christ, we are preserved. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 38 and 39, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should not lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. Verse two, Jude says, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude's heartfelt greeting hints to the importance of his letter. Mercy, peace, and love 
three essential attributes of God needed in the midst of trial or testing. Here, Jude is invoking them concerning the danger of false teaching, which leads to apostasy, the falling away from God, who is the Christ. Rejecting God, turning away from him because of false teaching. And then you got to ask yourself about the seed that falls on the ground. Some of that seed is taken away by birds. Some of that seed grows up through thorns. How is your ground? Meaning, how is your heart when the word fell in it? Nothing should be able to take God's love from you. The decision that you make to know God, to, to know who Jesus is, to accept that sacrifice, nothing should be more important to that. Because to not know God is to not know Jesus. To not know Jesus is to not know God. First Timothy chapter four, verses one and two reads, now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceptive spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. When your conscience is seared, you don't even realize that what you're doing is wrong. You think you're standing up for truth. And there's a lot of people professing false gods who believe that they're standing up for truth because they've been so engulfed in a lie for so long that they believe it. The Apostle Paul also tells us in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So anything other than this, he's saying, let them be accursed. Jude knowing without the vitality of the gospel truth surging in the hearts of believers, apostasy is inevitable. Therefore, the Holy Spirit be multiplied to you. John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, Jesus says, however, when the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, Therefore, I said that he will take from of mine and declare it to you. Jesus said, all things that the father have are mine. That's backed up by God saying, this is in my, this is my beloved son. Hear him. No Jesus, no God. The resurrected Christ came to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, Beloved, why? Beloved. While I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered unto the saints. Now that word beloved is the same word used by God towards his only begotten son, Jesus. This time in Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Two different, two different verses, two different people, which is confirmation. A cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Because of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, we believers in Christ are beloved by God. John chapter 1, verses 2 through 13 says, but as many 
as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jude intended to edify his beloved brothers and sisters in Christ on their common salvation. But common here is not in the sense is not in the sense that there's there's not in the sense of a common that the salvation is just common to anyone, but in the sense of there's no partiality in salvation. Salvation is not different for you if you're rich, black, poor, white, young, or old. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that not and that not of your yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, least anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Jesus did the work. That was Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the verse I just read. Jesus did the work. Believers today, the work we do today is the evidence of what Jesus did in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies, in our souls. We can't take credit for something that he's done. Anyone that tries to take credit for something that he's done is really doing a disservice to the love that Jesus showed them. I don't stand up here today because of anything that I've done. Really, it's nothing that I've done. I would have never, ever expected to be standing at a pulpit doing a message. Never. But it just shows what God can do. It's amazing when you think about Moses saying, I can't, I can't speak. And God saying, who gave man tongue? Or no, who gave man mouth? You know, it's like he will give you what you need. He will show you things that will blow you away. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 tells us, for as many are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And as Jude said in his day, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints still stands today. I think it stands even more today. And this is one biblical definition of contend, to agonize. It is the spirit of true agony which, pos which possesses one who is contending. The agony of spirit, the agony, agony of the spirit and love for the gospel should be in the hearts of every believer. Contending means to fight while standing on the very thing being assaulted. It means to stand against all who undermined it. So when we fight, we fight for the faith. And when we fight, we don't fight with our hands. We don't fight with fighting with fighting swords, we don't fight with guns, we fight with the truth. There's nothing else needed but the truth. To fight the good fight of faith, you must rely on God's truth. It is the truth that strengthens the faith, and his word is truth. Verse 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So crept is to move slowly and carefully in order to avoid being heard or noticed. You know, that sounds like a SEAL team member or uh, uh, undercover operative who, who goes undercover to uh, break up illegal activities, you know? But no, these men Jude are talking about are ungodly men, standing for, not standing for the truth of God, but banking on lies, causing division. They were teaching things like you can continue to sin, and it didn't matter because because of grace. But we are told in chapter, in Romans chapter six, Romans chapter six, 
verse 1 through 2, by Paul, the Apostle Paul. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin li live any longer in it? When Jesus was baptized, the first thing he said when he came up out of the water is, repent for the kingdom of heaven draws nigh. One thing that we have to do is we can't want to do those things that separate us from God because heaven is a righteous place. There is no sin in heaven. So that's the danger that people, we're no different from any other sinner out there. It doesn't matter what sin it is. The difference is confession and repentance. Nobody's going to be perfect, but if you think you don't have to repent of your sin, that's a dangerous place to be in. Because when you die, you die with that sin. That means that sin has to be judged. If you go to court and you stand before a judge, that judge has to judge you because that's his job. He has to be judge. When you stand before God with sin on you, if you don't have the blood of Jesus Christ, then you have to be judged. And that judgment, we already know what it is. Jude said that they were marked out for this condemnation. God knows the heart of all men, whether they are rebellious or submissive to his gospel truth. And he has set a time for his judgment for such condemnation. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 read, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division. And he says, note, he's saying, notice and observe with care who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who, who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Now there's only two reasons that I believe that you can be simple in the faith. And one is you're a new believer, lacking spiritual wisdom. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2 tells us, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So if you're a new believer, get in the word. Stay in the word. Because that's what's going to build you up. If you know the truth, you'll be able to detect the lie. And two, you profess the Lord, but you don't seek him. You're seeking the Lord when you're reading the word of God, when you're communicating with God. You're feeding the spirit of God who is in you. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 14 reads, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those by, who, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So for an example, to discern spiritual gifts, that's more like meat than milk. But the longer you stay in the word, you get to that point where you can discern spiritual gifts. The more that God gives you, the more that he takes you along this path, and the, and the more wisdom he gives you, the more that you can discern. Again, Jesus said in John, in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. For your word is truth. When you fight, fight with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, his truth. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, For I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was bruised, and that he rose, he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Fight with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fight with the fire God has afforded you. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven reads, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Those are all the things that we need to testify to his truth. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us, 
For we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. When you fight now, when you fight, know this, every knee shall bow. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 reads, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The truth is and always will be Jesus Christ is Lord. If you're with him, then your kingdom is, then if you're with him, then yours is the kingdom of heaven. If you're not with him, then the Bible tells us that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you're not with Jesus Christ, it's as easy as ABC. A, admit that you're a sinner. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul wrote, for the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Turning to Jesus is the only way to be forgiven and set free from your sin, and to be made perfect in the eyes of God. So the next step is believe with your heart. Believe with all your heart that Jesus is Lord and that he died for your sins, that he rose from the grave and that and will come again in the glory to judge the living and the dead. Romans chapter 10 verses 10 through 11 tells us, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And once you admit you're a sinner, and you believe Jesus died for those sins, you must repent of those sins and turn to Jesus. And the way that you do that is by calling upon his name. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call out to Jesus and confess that you can't do it in your own, that you need him, that you want to submit to him and surrender your will to him as your Lord and Savior, meaning that you want to die to self and allow Jesus to be Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that, brothers and sisters, is the truth. So we're going to partake in communion. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Rodney to come up. And uh, to partake in communion, we need to free ourselves from sin. And that is prayer.